Since we're um, looking at a whole book, we won't read the whole book. Maybe if we were in Russia, we'd read the whole book, right? But uh, go ahead and open to Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to read the first 14 verses, and then I'll read chapter 4 in Colossians, uh, the, uh, the end of the book. Um, so I do want to have some Bible reading. All right, and for those who don't know who, where Colossians is, it's go eat popcorn or Gentiles eat pork chops, right? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And it reads, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to you to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now go ahead and turn to chapter 4. So he gives a farewell and greetings here. <clears throat> and it reads, Masters, give your bond servant what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant, in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open a door, open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ to which I also am in chains that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstance and con- circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, there are, there are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They, are, they have proved to be a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is One of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you. And those who are in Laodicea and those in Heropolis, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus, and the church that is in in his house. Now when the epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea, and say to Acrippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. This salutation my, by my own hound, Paul. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. Let's pray. 
Lord, we are so thankful that we could gather today to hear your word. We thank you uh, that you wrote a letter to the church of Colossae years ago through the Apostle Paul, that Paul wrote it, but of course it comes from your words. And Lord, I pray that it would have life-changing effect on us as it did the church in Colossae and also the church in Laodicea as it would have been read to the both of those churches. Lord, I pray that as the weeks ahead and the months ahead, as we, as we study this book, that our hearts would be more confirmed, that our hearts would, 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 would have, would have them, would, our hearts would be thinking about the preeminence of Christ, that we would be, that you would conform us more in the image of your Son. And that we would make him more important to us than he is right now. Lord, I pray that you would bless the preaching of your word, that you would hide this, your servant behind the cross. Lord, we thank you that we could gather today and be encouraged from your word. And we praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. And um, it was really encouraging to, uh, to study the book of 1 Corinthians. I found it very challenging. I found a lot of the things in our current culture and the current churches in the book of Corinthians. Very encouraging book to study. Now we're moving to the book of Colossians. And uh, Bill's not here, but Bill encouraged me to uh, preach the book of Colossians. So I said, okay, I'll preach the book of Colossians. And so we're encouraged today uh, as an overview of it. So we're going to take a bird's eye view of the book. And so that way you can kind of get an understanding of where is Colossae, um, the, outline of Coloss- uh, the outline of Colossians, just an overview. So I want to examine the background of the book, and then I want to look at why Paul wrote the letter, and then we'll look at the outline of the book. Um, And so first off, uh, the book of Colossians was written to the church in Colossae. So the question one should ask is, uh, where where is Colossae in understanding the book of the letter? Um, So it's 100 miles east of Ephesus. And we have a map here on where it would be. As you can look here, that looks like modern day Turkey, doesn't it? And there's Greece. Right, but in the ancient world, we we see that Ephesus. If you just go a hundred miles east of Ephesus, that's where uh, Colossae is. You see, right by Laodicea, and you can understand why Paul says, "Have it be read in the church of Laodicea," because those churches were close to one another. Now, Colossae was a city in Phygeria on the Lycus River, in one of the branches of the Mender, that's the river, and three miles from Mount. Camdus is about 8,000 feet. Um, not quite as high as our Wasatch front, but pretty high, 8,000 feet. And it stood at the head of the gorge with the two streams unite and on the great highway traversing the country from Ephesus to the Euphrates Valley, 13 miles from Heropolis and 10 miles from Laodicea. And so you see that they're really close to Laodicea. And and Laodicea, of course, is mentioned in the book of Revelation. Not in a good way, but nonetheless mentioned. And some of the other uh, cities that are there, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Ephesus, they're also mentioned in the book of Revelation. So in um, looking at this, it is modern-day Turkey, and there were Jews and Gentiles that lived in Colossae. And if you were to study ancient history, you would see that they estimate, I think it is 4 to 10% of the Mediterranean world was Jewish, and there was Jewish people there in that area of Colossae. They say in 62 AD that there was 11,000 Jews. And if you look through the New Testament, you find that Jewish people who reject the faith early in early church history, they like to teach false Things and come into churches and try to stir up problems. So we see in the background of this book that there are false teachers with a Jewish background. And you also see a little bit of maybe Gnosticism. Uh, You see a worship of angels. And so you're seeing different things in this book. Much like Galatians, they were trying to invade the church. 
Now, Colossae was known for exporting uh, wool, so there was a lot of wool there, um, and um, probably from sheep. And, and you see also that there was, this was the hometown of Philemon and Onesimus. As we had uh, Matthew Allinger preach uh, a few weeks ago when he was doing his internship here, we had him uh, look at Philemon for us so that we kind of get a little bit of background for Colossae. So when was uh, Colossians written? It was written uh, during Paul's imprisonment. And if you look over, if you don't have to look there, we got in our notes, but if you look at Colossians 4.18 and his last verse, he says this, the salutation by my own, Paul, my own hand, Paul, and he says, remember my chains. Grace be with you, amen. So he was in prison. Paul was in prison in Rome. And it would have been written in 60 to 62 AD. And um, the audience, Paul did not know them personally, but the church was uh, planted by Epaphras, as we notice in the first chapter. If you go back to chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, we already looked at this when I read it. It says, as you've learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, and not only is he a dear fellow servant, who is faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. And so there is communication between Epaphras and the church that he's planted, and also with Paul. And then at the end of Colossians, in Colossians 4, 12 and 13, Epaphras is again mentioned, and it says, Epaphras, who is one of you, that's because he's from he, he's part of this church, a bondservant of Christ, greets you always laboring fervently for you in prayers. So he not only wants to teach him the word, but Epaphras also labors in praying. And that's what elders and teach an elder or a pastor should do is be praying for people that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear with him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea, and those in Heropolis. So this man cared about his region. He didn't just maybe say, well, the church of Ephesus is great. Maybe everybody should go to the church of Ephesus. Instead, he wanted to see a church in Laodicea. He wanted to see churches all over the place, and he had a great zeal. And so we find with Epaphras that he is a missions-minded guy, right? He wants to see God work, and so he's the one that planted the church. Um, and we find in the New Testament there are many churches that Paul planted. But this one was planted by Epaphras, and this shows us that not only apostles planted churches in the first century, but others did. Isn't that encouraging? It wasn't like, we'll leave that to the apostles. They're professionals. No. Epaphras and others planted churches. And even in the church of Rome, it wasn't planted by Paul. It was planted by somebody else. So why did Paul write this letter to the Colossians? Why did he write the letter? Well, Epaphras had told Paul about what was happening in Colossae, and there needed to be guidance in the church. And, and really, if you think about it, there should be guidance in all churches, and there's need of guidance in all churches because we're flawed people, right? We make mistakes, and sometimes we have blind spots, and sometimes we don't know how to deal with things. And so here he, he writes a letter to them to help them to have guidance in their church. And I really think that there is a couple themes. So in understanding the themes of the letter, I think that there's two main themes. Um, and one of them is false teaching. And, and you probably could say that that's a theme in almost every book in the New Testament of all the epistles, right? And even when Jesus was around... Satan wants to replace the gospel with a false gospel or a false God or something false. And so you see a lot of false teaching here that I think is applicable for Utah. And I think it's applicable for Missouri. It's applicable for all of us. And also, I think the main theme is the preeminence of Christ. Um, I think that a lot of what gets rid of false teaching, a lot of what encourages brothers and sisters in Christ is when they make everything about Christ in their life and then they, they submit to him. So I want to show you some verses that show that the false teachers 
We're invading the church in Colossae. So what I'm going to have you do is you're going to go through and see some of these verses here in Colossae, in the Colossians, in the book of Colossians. And, um, and so in looking at this, Paul tells them how to combat false teachings. All right? And Paul tells the Colossian church that the false teachers used persuasive words. Look at chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Look what he says here, what Paul says. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with what? Persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfast of your faith in Christ. So, just like the Colossian church, are there to beware of persuasive words. And false teachers can be good speakers, right? They can be good communicators. And they can have keen intellects. Um, they could use words that are highly sophisticated, right? And they could, and they, and they are very, some of them are very smart. But they don't focus on the Bible, but they focus on themselves and their own abilities, right? What is interesting is Paul in Corinthians said this, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. And that's from 1 Corinthians 2.1. 1 Corinthians 2.1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. What else does he address here in Colossians? Look at 2.8. Beware of worldly philosophies and empty deceit from men. Um, and uh, we're battling philosophies now in our country. And we're battling empty deceit. Look here, it says, Beware, at least anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. And uh, if you just take this and you put it down and you start listening to the world, the, the world's ideas start to sound pretty good, and all of a sudden you get sucked in, and you're like, wow, that's really amazing. And then all of a sudden you, you aren't studying this, you're studying... Um, something in culture rather than the Word of God. And he says this, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not abiding in Christ. And really, if you guys have uh, studied philosophy, it means the love of knowledge or the pursuit of knowledge. And sadly, false teachers come with knowledge, but it's not knowledge from God, but from men. Uh, if you really think about every false religion, if you think about Islam, you think about Mormonism, it's saying, you know what, we're going to use the Bible to say that it has some good things, but I want you to put it down and listen to Muhammad, or I want you to put it down and I want you to listen to Joseph Smith, or I want you to put it down and you listen to Helen White, or whoever else it is, but the whole idea is you need to put this down and listen to science. You need to put this down and listen to Karl Marx. You need to put this down and listen to Buddha or whoever it would be. Because what they're doing is they're going to the traditions of men or according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. We need to understand that. Um, we want people that are teaching God's word, that their love is not in some kind of knowledge that's outside of the word of God, but their love is for the word of God just like the psalmist in 119 and the psalmist in 19, right? Um, we, we want somebody who loves God's word and their knowledge is the fear of the Lord, right? And their wisdom is the fear of the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom. Now, what we see is there's different kind of false teachers in Colossae. And one group he talks about has seems to have a Jewish background. And, and I think you could say that this is beware of, a, a, of Jewish false teachers. Maybe today we could say beware of those who profess Christ that have some kind of Christian understanding and they're twisting Scripture, right? Uh, Peter uh, talks about how false teachers 
twists the scriptures to their own destruction. And he also talks about how Paul's writings were hard to understand and how they take those writings and they twist them. And they'll take a verse and they'll make that verse so that it means something that it doesn't and build the whole false doctrine off of it. So look what he says here in 2.16 here in Colossians about it seems like they're false teachers. He says, so let no one judge you in food or in drink. Uh, and you remember the, the uh, restrictions in the Old Testament? Or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. So it seems like they were bringing in Old Testament practices and twisting them into making them maybe part of salvation or requirements for salvation. And Paul says this about the false teachers. Um, they have this kind of humility, but it's not a true humility, but it's a what? A false humility, right? Beware of false humility. And Paul gives them this warning. He says, let no one cheat you out of your reward in 2.18. Sorry, here in Colossians 2.18. Let no one cheat you out of your reward. This course would be the Bema Seat Judgment taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into these things which he has seen, has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And um, what you see with unbelievers is there's this appearance of humility, but really they're really concerned about themselves. And what you see with false teachers are they're motivated by power, sex, and money generally, right? And, 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 and fame, and, and there's a pride. And they're vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And, and I've found that there's a false humility in knowledge. You, you see people, they have all this knowledge of the Bible, but they don't apply it, and it doesn't change them. There's not been a regeneration, but it's just a bunch of knowledge can be a false humility. You might say, well, that person, they know the Scripture really well. Well, do they know the Scripture? Does it, has it internally changed them? Paul says, watch out for false teachers. So throughout this uh, letter, we see a lot on false teaching. The other theme, which I think is the main theme of the book, is the preeminence of Christ. Um. And um, how do we see that he's preeminent? I'm going to give you some of the things that we see. Um, that he is the eternal God who became a man. Very important. Jesus, we know John 1, 1 through 3, John 1, 14. But also um, Colossians 2, 9 and 10. He says this, For in him, that is Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all, principality and power. And then in Colossians 1.16, if you look over here to Colossians 1.16, He is the Lord over all creation. For by Him and all are all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. Isn't that a beautiful verse? It is telling us that he is the Lord over all the creation because he, of course, created it. Also, why else should he be preeminent? Because he's the one and only reconciler. No priest, uh, no pastor, no person can reconcile you to God. The only person that can reconcile you is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we're ambassadors of reconciliation that we proclaim the truth, but we can't re reconcile anybody Listen to this in Colossians 1, 20 and 22. And it says this, And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has what? reconciled in the body of the flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. And so he should be preeminent because he is the one and only reconciler. And he reconciled you when you were dead in your sins and trespasses and when your mind was wicked, 
And you were alienated and you were an enemy of God, right? So he's a great reconciler. And how did he do that? Through the blood on the cross, through his death, right? That's why we love crosses because when we see the cross, we think of him dying for us and him reconciling us to the Father. He also is, he is the Christian's only hope in life and death. I love the New City Catechism when it says, he's your only hope in life and death. Listen to this, because in Colossians 1.5, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, because of the hope which is laid up in you in heaven. So your hope goes to the next life, right? And you're going to experience, and you already are experiencing his eternal love, right? That's why in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, as we learn, love is eternal. That's why it's greater than the hope and faith, because ultimately our hope is in the end when we're resurrected, and after we're resurrected, we're going to be with him, and we'll be up with him in heaven. And then heaven will come to earth. So our hope is found in our future heaven. Uh, Colossians 1.23, if you look here at Colossians 1.23, it says this, For if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you've heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Um, and you think about it, Paul's life was changed on the road to Damascus. And after it was changed, his hope was found in Christ. Hope of the gospel is in Jesus Christ. Look at Colossians 1.27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of what? Hope of glory. So isn't this some good stuff? Right? As we're walking through this, I know I'm going through it kind of fast, but there's all this good stuff. He is our only source of strength. Even if you're an unbeliever, your strength comes from who? Christ. Look here at Colossians 1.11. It says this, Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for the all patience and long suffering with joy. And then in uh, Colossians 1.29, to this end I also labor, striving according to this his working, which works in me mightily. And remember when he talks about Paul talks in Corinthians, we were looking at Corinthians, and he's comparing himself to the other apostles, and he says, he says, the grace that I had was from who? Not I, but the Lord. So he works mightily. Um, also, he is our Redeemer. He should be preeminent because he's our Redeemer. Uh, Colossians 1.14, not only is he a reconciler, he's a Redeemer in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And we know that one, right? We, we, that's why we have a cross and we think about it, is because he is our redeemer. That's why he should be preeminent. He redeemed us from all our sin, and Paul says it brought us through the he brought us through his perfect death. And um, one thing that's kind of encouraging, uh, coming out of Mormonism, and um, and just thinking about this, but he redeemed us from the curse of the law. Uh, isn't that amazing? Look over to 2.11 through 15. Um, if, if you were to try to live the law perfectly, could you ever live it perfectly? Never, right? But Christ lived the law perfectly. Romans tells us that he lived the law perfectly in our place. Look here at 2.11 through 15. In him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith 
and the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcised of your flesh, he has made us alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle, spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. Isn't that amazing? Uh, we should just be so excited about this book. Why? Because it's all about the preeminence of Christ. And we need to be reminded of this because we're sinful and we start making it about me, myself, and I. His redemption brought about eternal life. Us to be righteous was through Him. We got His righteousness, freedom from the law. We get peace with God from Him. We're no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. Christ is so preeminent that Paul tells us and tells the Colossians he is fully God. Uh, listen to Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And then in 119, if you'd go down to 119, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Colossians 2.9, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he's fully God. Colossians is full of this, right? Full of the nature of Christ. Also, he's a creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. It's one of my favorite verses in all of scriptures is here in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. I just love it. Um, in the parade one year, we wrote Colossians 1, 16 on our shirts. And why? Because we want everybody to know he's preeminent. He's not the brother of Satan. He's not a prophet. He's the eternal God. And not only is he the eternal God, but he, he not only created everything, but he is the sustainer of everyone and everything. And he needs to get glorified by it. And he needs to be preached as if preached preached to people that he is the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything look at this in verses 16 and 17 for by him some things no it doesn't say some things all things were created that are in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Isn't that amazing? He holds the atoms in the universe together. He holds all the planets that are out there and all the stars in their place. And he sustains your heart that's beating here today. As you're here listening, your heart is beating. The air that you breathe, he is sustaining. He sustains everything. And personally, for the Christian, he is the head of the church. He should have preeminence because he's the head of the church. It's no pastor, it's no elder, it's no deacon, it's not a collective group of people, it's not some preacher that's so amazing compared to other preachers, it is Christ that's the head of a the church, right? Look here in Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in him, in all things, he may have, what? The preeminence. And any church worth its salt makes the church around the one who is preeminent, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not men, not women, but Christ. Paul says to the Colossian church, he is the head of your local church and every local church. And what it's also encouraging from this Colossians 1.18 verse is the God-man conquered the dead. He conquered the dead. Uh, Colossians 1.18, and he's the head of the church 
head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. He raised from the dead. Colossians 3.1. It's a great promise here. If then you are raised with Christ, because He's raised you, right? Seek the things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Uh, if you want to be happy, well... I don't know if I like the word happy. If you want to be joyful as a Christian, you seek the things above. He is our all-sufficient Savior. Look at verses 1-4 through again here in Colossians 3. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not the things of the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. I want you to notice that in the book of Ephesians, it is said that the book of Ephesians focuses on the body of Christ. Colossians focuses on Christ being the head of the body. Right? Ephesians focuses on the body of Christ. Colossians focuses on the head of the body, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I mentioned, there's two major themes in this book we will see in the coming weeks. He's combating false teachings and secondly, the preeminence of Christ. And, and as we go through it, we need to ask ourselves, is Christ preeminent in my life? Do I think about him all the time? Do I dwell on his eternal nature? Do I dwell on that he's the creator and sustainer of everyone, everything? Do I, do I focus on that he's my reconciler, that he reconciled me? Do I focus on his redemption? Do I focus on the fact that he's my all in all? Do I focus on the fact that I wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for him? And I would never be redeemed if it wasn't for him. We need to be focusing on those things. So now I want to look at the outline of the book. The outline of the book. And I didn't get this outline myself. I, I stole it from somebody else. And somebody else probably stole it from somebody else. But I think it's good because it has two S's here. Christ is supreme. One and two. Two chapters. Christ is supreme. And then secondly, submit to Him. Three and four. Submit to Him. So it would look like this. Doctrinal, chapters 1 and 2. Practical or application, chapters 3 and 4. 3 and 4. So I'm going to look at the first two chapters here. Uh, Christ is supreme. We already went through the introduction. Um, Christ is a supreme being, so the supreme being is thanked in the introduction for his work in Colossae. So you saw that in the first 14 verses. We look at verse 3. We give thanks to God the Fa and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on and he says why he's thankful. And he tells us in verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and for your love for all the saints. Um, one thing that we don't do enough is thank God for his grace and his grace, his um, grace and salvation, but also his grace in our lives every day and him sustaining us. And if you notice in Paul's letters, he always begins by thanking God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he mentions their grace and peace that God has bestowed on these elect people or the church. And that's so important that he, he, he says it all the time. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's always thanking God for their faith, which we learn from Ephesians that he gives faith, right? And he gives, if you believed, it was because he gave you faith to believe. And so that's really encouraging. Paul thanks God for their fruit that is manifested in their lives. Paul thanks God that they have learned from the truth from Epaphras and obeyed the Lord. And then Paul prays for them to have wisdom and spiritual understanding. And so he's praying for them before he even gives them information. Isn't that interesting? Maybe that's what we should do is 
When we go out and we preach the gospel and we give people scripture, maybe we should be praying for them before what? Before we share with them. Or maybe if there's a brother or sister that we need to talk to in the Lord, maybe we should pray before we what? Talk to them about scripture. Or maybe we should pray when we get up in the morning. Who did that? Who prayed when he got up in the morning? Our Lord did, right? Um, how often does psalmist pray? All the time, right? And, um, and so he, he prays for them. He prays that they have wisdom and spiritual understanding. And then after that, um, he, he gives one of the most beautiful um, poems, they, they say it's a poem, of his deity in 1, 15 through 23. And I've already read some of this, but I want to read it again because I think it's just so beautiful. Look at verses 15 through 18. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities and powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things exist, consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And so I'm going to encourage you, church, and I'm going to encourage Chatham Bible Church, who is part of the universal church, so we're all part of the church here, to memorize Colossians 1, 15 through 18. I think it's an important scripture to memorize. So you guys can all just raise your hand and say, I will go home and do that. <laughs> all right. So Colossians 1, 15 through 18. He's the Im image of the invisible God. So in those in 15 through 23, it's his deity, the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation. This refers to rank. It's an Old Testament term. He created everything. He's the king of creation. He brings about a new creation, the church. He does this because he's the great reconciler and he is the supreme beings. So what's interesting is after Paul mentions his deity and him being the reconciler, uh, mentions that he is the creator of the church because uh, we're a new creation. Paul says he suffers for him. Um, is this amazing to think about? Before I get into this, think about this. You can't pay God back for your salvation. But the one thing you can do here on earth until you die is you can suffer for him. And um, when they were persecuted in the early church, they counted it as a privilege. They can't give him any payment for his grace. But we can suffer for him. Isn't that amazing? So rather than saying, oh, ow, oh, it hurts to suffer for him, maybe you say, wow, I count it a privilege to suffer for him. I can't ever give him anything back. No matter all the works I do, I, 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 can't, even, I can't even pay him anything for his grace. But I can't suffer for him. So Paul suffers for him. Paul lives for Christ, therefore he suffers. And speaking to others about Jesus Christ brings about suffering. Um, you know, we're to live a life that, that's glorifying to the Lord. And whether you're in a business job or whatever you're doing, you're to live. But God also gave you a mouth so that it will what? Speak and share, right? Now, obviously, you want to use uh, the best opportune times and he even tells us in Colossians what is it three where he he says that God would grant him a door right um and and that why did he want him that God would grant him a door so that he could what proclaim Christ to other people um I remember a professor in in seminary uh told us that he he actually knew Bill Bright personally and and I'm not crazy about everything that Bill Bright did um uh, I probably would write his uh, four spiritual laws differently. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it was the best gospel track. But one thing he said that impressed him about uh, Bill Bright is every time he'd be around somebody, he would look to share the gospel. And uh, this professor said one time he was in a he was in a um, an elevator, and there was people there, and, and he and he says, 
This elevator, it goes up and down, doesn't it? And there's like, yeah. And he goes, it's kind of like life, up and down, up and down. And then he said, he shared the gospel with these people. And um, when you share the gospel, you suffer for Christ. And it's a privilege to share the gospel. Romans tells us that it's, it's a beautiful, that your feet are beautiful because you're what? Because you're sent to share God's word with people. So Paul tells others about the mystery of Christ, the riches of God's glory, and we care for others in the church because the Supreme One died for them. So notice that the reason why Paul has affections, and the reason why we should have affections for brothers and sisters in Christ is because Paul cares for the Colossian church because God does. God died for them. He has a care for the church in Colossae, and also in Laodicea. Look at verse 1 here in chapter 2. For I want you to know that I that what a great conflict I have for those in Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So he has a care for the Colossians and the Laodicea church and those who haven't seen him. He wants them to be assured in Christ, and he wants them to not be deceived by the enemy. He wants them to be firm in their faith, and that Christ's teachings are supreme to false teachers. So he mentions that, and then he jumps into 2, 6 through 8. Beware of false teachers. We already looked at this, uh, the second here. And um, he tells them you need to be planted in the truth. Do not let false teaching persuade you, but be rooted in the word of God. And do not let empty deceptive philosophies take you captive. The Supreme One has united us with Him. Um, In our Sunday school hour, we we talked about how Christians could be prostitutes in the sense that they're prostituting themselves to a false worship instead of to God. And um, this whole idea... Um, is we are to have assurance of our union in Christ. And, and, and part of um, helping us not prostitute ourselves is to remember that our assurance of our union in Christ, that we are in Christ. He bought us. He owns us. We're part of the church. Isn't the church? It's not churches. It's church singular, right? So you have the fullness of Christ in you. He is all-powerful. He lived the law perfectly in your place. There were many false teachers like Galatians, and Paul wanted them to know that you have to, you don't have to obey the law. Jesus obeyed the law perfectly for you, and Paul says, You are put off the sinful nature. You have been buried um, and baptized with him and raised with him. Isn't that wonderful? And um, when you start sinning and doing all that, it's just like eating as much candy as you can, and then after you eat as much candy as you can, what are you? You're sick, right? As uh, Thomas alluded to earlier, right? So the Christian life of grace is supreme to the false teachings that are promoted. So he says the assurance of your union in Christ, and then he mentions these false teachings in, in verses 16 through 23. He, first he addresses of false legalism, trying to live by the law and not living for Christ. Second, he addresses false spirituality. Third, he addresses false asceticism. So um, so the first part of the book focuses on doctrine. So we've looked at chapters 1 through 2, chapters 1 and 2. And then uh, after Christ is supreme... In chapters 1 and 2, Christ is supreme. Um, Chapters 3 to 4 is is to submit to him. And uh, there's a lot of things here in submission to him. Uh, If you were to read through Romans or you read through Ephesians, this is what Paul does all the time. He gives all this doctrine, and then he says, just fill your head full of knowledge. No, that's not what he says. He says, use that knowledge and what? Apply it, right? First 11 chapters of Roman is all about the doctrine of who God is, what he did in salvation, all that. And then chapters 12, he tells us to take 
ourselves and offer our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to Him, right? And to renew your mind with these truths. So here He, he uh, tells us to put on and to submit to Him. To submit to Christ. And we're to submit by seeking the things above. Who should you submit to? The one sitting at the right hand of God. That's what he tells us. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Your perspective should be your life is in Christ and not on earthly and earthly things. Your perspective should be you will come back with Christ. Because he mentions um, that he will appear then you also will appear with him in glory. And so you're going to come back with him. Isn't that awesome? How are we to submit to Christ? In verses 5 through 9, submit by putting off the old life. Uh, you're a new creation. You don't, you don't just continue living like you did before you were saved because Christ died for those things. All the wicked desires that are part of this world system Align yourself with God and God's commands and do what is right and not what is evil. Uh, that's what he says here about submit by putting off the old life. Submit by putting on the new self in verses 10 through 7. Uh, you have put on the new self, put on your new life in Christ. How? He tells us, let this peace of God rule over you. Uh, let let your peace not come from you trying to control everything, right? I'm going to control my kids. I'm going to control the government. I'm going to control all these wicked people out there. I'm going to go get guns and I'm going to control everything. No. Your peace comes from God. It's not your circumstances. The circumstances just reveal your heart. You get that? A lot of times we don't see people's hearts until what? Circumstances happen. And when we do have those circumstances, we go, whoa, I need, I'm failing here. I need to what? Submit to who? To Him. Submit to Him. So let His peace of God rule over your hearts. Remember Philippians 4, where He says it will guard your heart. The peace of God will guard your heart. So let, it, let His word Dwell richly in you. Um, when you study God's word, be like a cow that chews its cud. As he's chewing, he's thinking about God's word and he's chewing it all day. And I, I know you guys aren't chewing your cud, but, but I'm saying that you, you should dwell on it. Maybe take a verse and just memorize that verse. Maybe somebody says, well, I don't read a lot. Well, just memorize one verse and, and think about that verse throughout your day. And pray that verse. And I have, I have um, a, a project for growth for you to do that if you want to. I, um, it's called Discovering Wonderful Things. Some of you guys have seen that. I'd be happy to print it out. And you could do that. Let His glory consume you. Uh, let His glory consume you. You know, I, I, think it's, I think it's amazing when you start looking at God's creation in looking at the Creator and His details more than the actual creation. You know, I'm stunned. Uh, when I look through a telescope, I don't say, wow, those stars are so amazing. I think, the God spoke all that? And not only that, but the stars are different. And aliens really couldn't exist because these stars are so far away. And if aliens existed, there's no way they could get here. You know, like Star Wars and those things, they mess up your mind. I mean, you can watch Star Wars, but I'm saying it messes up your mind because you think all that stuff's what? Accessible, and it's not accessible. The, the whole universe is not accessible. And it's so big and large, you should be like, whoa. God is so big, and I am so what? Small. No, not just small. Really, really small. Really, really insignificant. And earth is really, really, really insignificant compared to what? The universe. Right? So you let His glory consume you. You let His glory consume you in looking at the universe. You also let His glory consume you 
in knowing that his son became a man and died for you, that the God of the universe became a man. Wow. So he goes on, and um, our society don't like this next one. He says, submit to the Lord's design in what? Relationships. Well, in today's society, what does that mean? If I want to be a father, I want to be a mother, or I want to be a two mothers, if I want to be a boy, or I want to be a girl, or I want to be a boy girl. I had a conversation with somebody the other day. Jim was there, and I think there was the guy said that there's 102 different definitions of genders now. No, there's only two genders. There's what? Male and female. You can read about them on the first chapter of Genesis, right? And one of them was incomplete until they had the other one, right? And um, so you submit to the Lord's design and relationships. Um, don't let the world tell you how a marriage should be ran or define a marriage. You let God define that. So don't let the world define relationships. Let the supreme one, and you submit to this, let God define what a wife and a husband is and to practice their role. Don't say, hey, what, what works best? What's, what's the most pragmatic thing to do here? No. You, you, you follow what God says. Um, children and fathers practice their role. He speaks about children and fathers. He speaks about slaves and masters are to practice their role in relationship. And then he speaks about relationship to unbelievers. Uh, how we're to treat unbelievers. There's a lot here for practical application. And, and he says in relationship to unbelievers, we're to pray for unbelievers. We're to share the gospel with unbelievers. So this is really pretty good stuff. 3.18 through 4.6. He's telling us this is how you should live in relationship to other people, whether it's your wife, whether it's your husband, whether it's your son, whether it's your daughter, whether it's an unbeliever that you're living by. And once Paul tells them how to honor the Lord in relationship, Paul gives a farewell. That's how he ends it. He gives a farewell. He mentions Tychus as an example. He mentions Onesimus as an example. So he says, you know, you've seen Onesimus. Uh, you've seen his relationship with Philemon and how he's loved him how they love each other, right? Because you guys studied finally. And you've, you've seen Tychicus as an example. And then greetings are sent from Aristarchus, uh, Mark, Justice, Epaphras, Luke. And, and I love this. And, and this is why we're preaching it. But Paul tells them to share the letter. Look at verse 16 here in chapter 4. I'm sorry, that was supposed to be 4, 7 through 18. I left it off there, sorry. 4, 7 through 18 was the last part of the outline. He tells them to share the letter. Look at verse 16. Now, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is also read also in the church of Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from the Laodicea. So, you know what? That one was probably not inspired as my guess because I've never heard of the, the epistle to Laodicea, but um, Paul wrote it. And um, I would say, Liberty Bible Church, Paul's saying, you also read it among you, right? Or Chatham Bible Church, or Cairo Bible Church, wherever it would be. So today we are sharing the letter and studying it just like Colossae and Laodicea. And it is just as much applicational for us today. He says, encourage Acrippus, and then he says what? Farewell. Farewell. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this rich book. This book is rich because it's not about us. It's about the preeminent one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we, we pray that we would listen to your Son, whom you are well pleased. That we not only listen to him, but we would obey him. Lord, I pray that in the coming weeks, and the coming months, that our hearts would be wanting to make Christ preeminent in our lives. 
that we would not only want to see him as supreme, but submit to him. Submit to him in areas of our life that we are not submitting to him, whether it's in our family relationships, whether it's in our marriage, whether it is sharing the gospel with unbelievers, praying for unbelievers, uh, whether it is that we're not seeking the things above, Lord, I pray that we would seek the things above. And Lord, as we look at all these practical applications, I pray that they would be dwelled on, like he says, dwell on the word of God richly, that all these things would be dwelt upon and that they would spring forth from our hearts because your Holy Spirit would be working in us. Lord, we thank you for your grace found in your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his blood on Calvary's cross that redeemed us. We thank you that he reconciled us, that we were enemies, and he reconciled us, and now we are children. And Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray today, Lord, that they would confess you as their Lord and Savior and that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.